All right, the effectual Bible student meets the spiritual requirements for Bible study. And now, in our second part of this uh, uh, series, the effectual Bible student has a habit of daily Bible study. Daily Bible study. And so that we're, we, we get down now to the heart of, of, uh, of what we need to establish in our Christian lives if we're going to learn the Bible. Jesus, in Matthew 4, verse 4, likened the Word of God to eating. In Matthew 4, verse 4, let's read that again. Very powerful, important verse on the Word of God from the lips of Jesus. Spoken to the devil. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. Well, he's talking about eating. We all understand that. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The mouth of God. Bread. Well, we, eat, we, we don't eat once in a while. We eat regularly. Amen. And we understand that. And it's not just because we're, uh, we've got to survive. We eat because we like it. And that's a blessing of God. God gave. My daddy used to call it goodies. God has given us so many goodies in this world. Amen. And he's filled this world with goodies for sinners that don't deserve anything at all. And we understand eating, and eating is a regular thing. And Jesus likened study of the Word of God to eating. And in the Old uh, Testament times, in the, in when, when Israel was out in the wilderness, uh, God gave them manna every day. And he gave it every day. He didn't give it enough for them to, uh, so that they could gather and that it would last for a week or a month. Every day they had to go out and gather the manna and eat it that day or it would rot. It didn't last. And that's the way it is with the Word of God. You know, once a week, doesn't work. Amen. You will not make progress that way. Once a month, uh, a little here and there. One man I was talking to in the Philippines, and I was talking to him about his Bible study habits. He said, uh, he said well, it's hit and miss. Well, that's not enough. You're, it's not hit and miss when it comes to eating the, uh, food. But he said it's hit and miss. Well, that's not enough. We have to establish a daily Bible study. There are habits that we have to establish in the Christian life. Godly habits. We know about bad habits. And, uh, but there's godly habits. And a godly habit is being in church every time, uh, 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 forsaking not, assembling ourselves together. That's a godly habit. Amen. It's an important habit. Yeah. Uh, and that's the way it is with Bible study. It needs to be, come, uh, be a habit that I establish. It's there. That's, my part of, that's the part of my life. I got all, many other things I do. That's something I do. Daily Bible study. And here's some suggestions for daily Bible study. Number one, we have to est establish a time. Now, this is what we teach to young people. And this is actually directly, this lesson is directly out of the one-year discipleship course, which is especially for young people, for teenagers. Establish the time. And uh, that depends on your schedule. For me, it's varied over the 41 years I've been saved. The best time usually is in the morning, Amen. first thing. But that doesn't always work out. And, uh, but whatever it is for you, according to your situation in life and schedule, you've got to find a time for the Lord and His Word. And you, you set that time, and that's your appointment with God. That's your date with God. We need to walk with the Lord. Talk with Him all the time about everything. All through the day. Pray without ceasing. But there needs to be a time I have a date with the Lord every day. And His Word. And it's a private time. And it's a special time. Establish a time. And it ought to be some serious time. The more the better. You say, how long? The more the better. The more the better. Amen. And uh, it depends on you. It's your choice. How much time do you want to spend with the Lord every day? God will make a way. If you put Him first, He will make a way for you to do that. You say, well, I'm so busy, and I got this, and I got that. And I made a decision when I was a, a, a brand-new Christian that I would never get a job that hindered my Christian life. 
and I never have, and I've never had to. Because if you make that kind of commitment in your Christian life, whatever area it might be in, God will make sure that you're not disappointed in that. Now, that's a fact. Amen. And if you make a decision like that in your life, and you, you're going to put God first, and, you're, uh, and He lets you down, it doesn't, doesn't help you out, will you tell me about it? Because I've been trying to write a book for 40 years, and the title is this, Saints That Served the Lord and He Let Them Down. And I'll never write that book, folks. You put God first. You make some godly decisions. He'll meet you there and he'll, he'll honor those decisions. Amen. And I did that in my, uh, in my early Christian life. I haven't always been full-time in the ministry. Secondly, we've got to establish a place. We've talked a little bit about that. It has to be a quiet, private place. As much as necessary. So that I can give my full attention to the Word of God and the things of God and the prayer there private place I've, I've, I've had my private devotion with the Lord and mine's ours it's not a few minutes but so many different places I, told, I think I mentioned about Carpenter's home the, that beautiful place by the lake where my granddaddy had died in the retirement center and, and I, I, would, I spent hours there before I, that first year I was saved and, there, and at, at different times sometimes I'll just get in my car and drive off and I'm by myself there at my car and that's perfect I'll park in a, in a Walmart parking lot when I'm traveling and uh, have no distractions, and there it is. Wherever it is, what, however it works, we have to establish a time and a place. And then, number three, we have to have some basic study tools, and we're going to talk quite a bit about that this week, what we need to have and how to use them. At the very least, we have to have a dictionary, a concordance, the treasure of scripture knowledge, which we're going to talk about, and, and, and some basic commentary. We're going to get into that. But number four, should have a notebook and a pen. Study requires writing things down, capturing things. I don't just read books. I capture things from books, and I write it down. That's why I can't do the audio book thing, because I've always got to be writing things down. And... Uh, Capturing things. Well, it gives me ideas, and so I have to write them down. I have to capture them. Amen. The first year I was saved, one of the things that I did as a brand new Christian, 23 years old, was I made my own topical studies. And as I was reading the Bible through, and I read it through at least twice that first year, I read the New Testament several times, just devouring the Word of God. And I wanted to capture things, and I, and I was interested in what the Bible said about everything, subjects. You know, what is the devil? Where did he come from? What is the devil all about? Angels, who are they? What are they? And uh, my nature, my, my nature, my heart, my mind, the soul, the spirit, the, the sin, you know, uh, 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 all these things, interested in those subjects. All of a sudden, in my Christian life for the first time, it never had been before. And so I, I, I got notebooks and I organized them according to top major topics in the Bible, like Satan or angels. And every time I read a verse about that, I wrote that down in the, under that topic and would study, made my own topical study. By the time I got to Bible college, I, I knew a lot of things. I, I had done a lot of study. And so it, it's not just reading, but capturing things and studying. Notebook and a pen. But number five, having a pencil for marking the Bible, which it should be a pencil, not a pen, because the pen will mess your Bible up. But a pencil, especially a mechanical pencil. I remember the first church I joined, God gave me a tremendous example about how to come to church and how to listen to preaching and how to capture things. In the first friend I had in the Lord, I lost my old friends after I kept trying to preach to them, and they weren't going the way I was going, so they, we went separate ways, and I asked God for good Christian friends. I asked God for that, and, and the first one of those, and I've had so many of those, but the first one was, his name was Richard, and I walked in that little church. It was a storefront church at that time, Bartow Bible Baptist Church. doesn't exist any longer. And there was a young man over there, 
And he had a big old study Bible, and he had a mechanical pencil, and uh, I think some colored pencils. He had all of his equipment. He was sitting there, and uh, he was studying the Bible. He was at church to study the Bible, and he was a Bible student. Every day he was a student, and uh, he was an example for me. I was already like that, but he was just more of an example to me like that. And, and I learned about that mechanical pencil thing. They might have been new in those days. I don't remember. But um, it's a tremendous advice. It doesn't bleed through your Bible. You can erase it. And uh, it doesn't have to be sharpened. It's a tremendous uh, uh, device. But it's to write the proper things in your Bible. And that's why I have a wide margin Bible. And that's, that's a, that is a great invention right there. Most languages don't have these things. We, Two of our converts in Nepal, members of our church, one of them is Russian. She's from Russia. She married a Nepali medical doctor, and they're there, and they're, they're tremendous encouragement to us. They were gloriously saved. He was a Hindu. She was r- Russian Orthodox, lighting candles and praying to icons and stuff. And they came to our church and got saved. And, and, uh, but she's, her mother tongue is Russian, actually, and they, and I've looked at the, I've bought her a couple Russian Bibles. I just bought her a new one on this trip. They don't have all the kinds of study Bibles and all the different kinds of sizes and kinds of Bibles we have in English. We have a wealth. Just something like a wide market. We take it for granted. Doesn't exist in other languages. But I have this wide margin Bible so I can write things down in my Bible. And, uh, but you need to be careful about what you write, write in your Bible. I've seen people, they write everything everywhere and, and you, and uh, after a while, you can't hardly read your Bible for all the stuff you write down. And then sometimes people don't write anything down. But I want to give you some suggestions about writing things in your Bible. This is very practical. And uh, we can underline things, but we need to underline very carefully, too. After a while, everything's underlined. Well, that defeats the purpose. If everything's underlined, then nothing's underlined. And so we have to underline properly. I, I like to underline things that help me see at a glance the divisions of a passage that I'm reading. For example, in Genesis 1, look at Genesis 1. Marking the Bible properly is a good part, a way of studying it. It helps you meditate, helps you concentrate, helps you focus on things. And then when you go back, it will bring things back to your, your memory. In Genesis 1, for example, all the way through here... Uh, the one reason we know that this is not billions of years, these six days, is it says, and the evening and the morning. And that's the way that Genesis 1 is divided, and the evening and the morning, by days. Well, I've, I've underlined those, and I actually shaded those. And you can see at a glance, then, the division of that chapter. In Revelation 2 and 3, I've shaded the names of the seven churches. That's the division of that. And at a glance, when I'm looking at that or teaching from that, then I can see this is Laodicea, this is Smyrna, this is whatever, Ephesus. And like that, uh, 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 to to the major divisions in a passage, I will underline or shade those. And uh, repeated thoughts are a good thing to underline or to shade in your Bible. Uh, I went through the whole Old Testament for two or three years, and I underlined every place where it says God said, or, or thus saith the Lord, that kind of thing. And I made my own count. You know, I had heard people say, well, 6,000 times, you know, it says God said or whatever. I wanted to see, count it myself. And so I did that. But it's major things like that, divisions and repeated thoughts. In Genesis 10, I've underlined after his kind, 10 times in Genesis, I'm sorry, Genesis 1. Ten times in Genesis 1, it says that God made all the creatures to reproduce after his own kind, which is very important. And that tells us that a monkey could never become a man, and it never has. And at Ezekiel, I underline, they shall know that I am the Lord. That's repeated all through Ezekiel. It's not repeated just because God likes to repeat things. It's there for emphasis. They shall know that I am the Lord. And, uh, and so I, I, I underline those repeated things and, and um, to show the, you know, how the passage is laid out at a glance. 
And that's the way I do with notes in the margin. I, I do it very judiciously. Writing notes in the margin is important, but it needs to be done with caution. I don't write everything, you know, I check things out. I try to check things out. A lot of times preachers will say things that simply are wrong because he heard it from somebody that heard it from somebody that heard it from somebody. And uh, it turns out it wasn't even right. And so I'm careful about what I'll write down. I try to check it out first. But uh, here's some things to write down in the margin of the Bible. This is what I've done. Definitions of words and names. Unless you have a photographic memory, but this will help you memorize these biblical terms, like mystery. What is mystery? How many of you could stand up tonight and tell me what mystery means in the New Testament? Would you raise your hand? Mystery. Don't lie, because I'll call on you. Now, what does mystery mean in the Bible? Okay, there's only a handful of people here tonight. Uh, Pastor Bailey. And... Uh, Okay, well, you don't know anything until you're taught. And, uh, but that kind of thing, when I find the meaning of these, I'll write it down somewhere in a major passage in my Bible. Well, I don't have to look them up anymore because I've looked at them so many times, but that's the first step in learning and, and keeping it in your mind, writing the definitions of things. For example, in Romans, I've written things down to show you the ex kind of things I write in the margin of my Bible. In Romans 2.22, and these, this was years ago. These, these notes go way back. I've changed Bibles many times, but I transferred my notes. And so these little notes would go way back to the beginning of my Christian life, actually, when I was first learning things. But I continue to write things in my Bible today. Romans 2.22, Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorreth idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? What is sacrilege? It means profane. And I wrote that in, my, in the marginal Bible. It's right here. In Romans 3, 20, 20 uh, it, 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 it has these words. In this passage here in Romans 3, do you know the definition of these words? Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. What's justified mean? Could you stand up and tell us tonight? What is the definition of justification? It's very important. Fundamental. So I wrote, uh, when I first learned it, I wrote there. Uh, the definition it means declared righteous. It's Bruce Lackey's definition. It's a beautiful definition. I've never found a better one. Declared righteous. God declares the sinner righteous because of the blood of Jesus. Wonderful. But it means nothing to you if you don't understand the words, right? means nothing at all. Verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption. Redemption, what's redemption mean? Could you stand up tonight and tell us? Bought with a price. Bought with a price. Well, that'll preach. And uh, Romans 3.25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation. Could you stand up tonight and tell us what propitiation means? You should be able to. If you've been saved very long, you should be able to. And if you can't, shame on you. Because it's simply a lack of care. The tools are available. I have been here many times and sold that encyclopedia. And all these words are in that encyclopedia. And you read the Bible, and you haven't even taken the time to look it up and learn what these precious words mean. Shame on you. Shame on you. If you don't understand the words, well, you don't understand the Bible. What are you getting out of the Bible? It means satisfaction of a debt. I write down cross-references. Uh, uh, very important thing to write down. We're going to look at the treasure of Scripture knowledge, which is thousands of cross-references, but no cross-reference book is exhaustive. And, and when I find a, a verse that applies to another verse and really helps explain it, I write that thing down in the margin. My margins are full of that stuff, stuff that's not in the treasure of Scripture knowledge that I've learned through the years and I've seen myself, and I'll write it down because the Bible explains the Bible. Amen. And uh, you've got to go to other passages to explain, and, 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 and it shows, shines light on that verse. But when you find those connections, they're precious, and, and you write them down.
For example, in Matthew 6.33. Matthew 6.33. Now, if you have a study Bible, there are a lot of cross-references in, in a good study Bible, maybe in the margins or on the, wherever they're put, usually in the, uh, in the center reference or underneath the verse. Those are cross-references. And when the Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament, It'll have the reference to the Old Testament verse. And those are cross-references. And But there's many, many that are not in any study Bible or any, e even the treasure scripture knowledge. And for example, Matthew 6, 23, If thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Well, what in the world does it mean? And uh, one cross-reference that I put there is uh, Proverbs 28, 22. Proverbs 28, 22. You see, the Bible's a self-defining book, actually. If it's studied properly, one part will define the other part. It, the words themselves are defined somewhere in the Bible. The Bible's own words. Proverbs 28, 22. He that hasteneth to be rich hath an evil eye. Eye. And considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. There's a, there's a good uh, uh, explanation, part of the explanation of what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 6, that direct application there. Uh, I was looking at the, the sin unto death. Where is that? First John chapter 5. Look at this. Recently added a couple cross-reference to the sin unto death. What is the sin unto death? Thought a lot about that. What is the sin unto death? And... Um, Anytime I find something new like this, it applies, I'll write it in the margin of my Bible. So when I go back there, if I'm teaching or a question comes up, it's right there. I can't remember all these things. I certainly don't have a photographic memory. Now, here in 1 John chapter 5, verse 16, it says, if, if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for him that it, them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. Uh, the Bible college students ask me questions. We have question and answer time every week, all the time. And uh, I teach seven hours a week in the Bible college there in Nepal. And they, they, our men, they're studying the Bible and they have all kinds of questions. And they challenge me to study. A lot of times I can't answer the question. And I'll say, I'll get back with you on that. And I do. And I try to go and, and search it out and study it out. And this came up. And they said, well, what is the sin unto death? Well, one of the cross-references is 1 Corinthians 11, uh, where it says, you know, that the, um, the, the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 11, 30 through 32, some had died in the church at Corinth because they abused the Lord's Supper. That's a sin unto death. Another cross-reference is um, Ananias and Sapphira, Acts 5, 1 through 11. I've got that written right here. Usually what I'm saying is that um, there won't be these things. You've got to dig this out for yourself. And if you're reading commentaries or you hear preaching and, and, and teaching, then you, you, you capture these things. You don't just assume, well, I'll remember that. You won't remember it. And, uh, well, you know, I can pick that up some other time. When are you going to pick it up some other time? You've got to capture it when you've got a chance. I'm talking about serious Bible study. Amen. And, uh, but here in 1 John 5, 16... We got those two, Acts 5 and 1 Corinthians 11, but here is one that I added recently, 2 Samuel 12, 13. 2 Samuel 12, 13. And I think this is the perfect the definition of the sin unto death and what it is and what, is, what it's not. I've taught in the jail for uh, years. I taught in the county jail, preached in the county jail. I, I was in jail before I was saved. And uh, questions would come up every week. And I would write things down so I could answer those questions. David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. He would have died. He would. But he repented. See, there, there's a lot of teaching there about the sin unto death. And there's other places that I've written down there, but... That's not the point of this. These are examples. My Bible's full of this kind of stuff. Full of it because I capture things all the time. Every day I, I write 
some little something in my Bible usually, and uh, that I'll learn from a commentary or whatever. Anyway, cross-references. And then uh, things to write in the margin of the Bible is um, doctrinal and teaching outlines. And I have little mini-sermons all, all in the margin of my Bible. If you're, and every believer should be a teacher. The, the mother should teach the children. That's who taught David, his mother and his grandmother. Not David, Timothy. His mother and his grandmother. And uh, teacher, the father needs to be the teacher of his family. And you need to be teaching and helping people out there in the world that are confused. And some of them will listen. And whether they do or not, you can give them a good little, uh, uh, some good teaching from the Bible. And uh, everyone needs to be a teacher. And I write things in my Bible, so I'm ready to teach any time. And I can refute false teachings and answer questions. If the issue of Sabbath comes up, I go right over to the notes I've written on the Sabbath in Exodus 20. And I, my books have this stuff. I use my own books all the time because I don't have a photographic memory. I use my own encyclopedia. But I put these things in the Bible so they're very convenient to have. And I'll go over to Exodus 20 if the issue of Sabbath comes up. And, the, and uh, here's all the major look, points on the Sabbath and why we don't keep the Sabbath and why, you know, why Israel did and the fact that it was assigned to Israel. It's all right there. It's all right there. And in any subject, basically, I've done that. I, when I was a new Christian, I, I started preaching in Tennessee. I was there at Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And, uh, but I would drive 60 miles from there to trace the city, Tennessee, to a little church, Maranatha Baptist Church. Hillbillies, definitely hillbillies. And uh, moonshining, feuding, murdering. And anyway, that's where I started preaching, and I ended up pastoring a little church there for a while. Not very successfully, but I tried. And, uh, and uh, one night, and I'd go up there and, and, and witness, knock on doors, go in the doors. One, one night I knocked on the door, and it was a Jehovah's Witness. I didn't know it. They invited me in. They were having a Jehovah's Witness Bible study. It was a female teacher. And they invited me in. They wanted to to deal with me and uh, she tore me apart she asked me questions I couldn't answer and uh, and and it was a challenge to me it embarrassed me but it was a challenge to me and uh, to study more Amen. and to be able to be ready for things like that and not say well my church says or my pastor says or my grandma believed but to know it yourself and you don't have a photographic memory either. And so that requires writing things in the Bible. The right things. Doctrinal teaching outlines. In Exodus 20, as I've said, I've written about the Sabbath. In Matthew 16, 18, I've, I've written why the rock refers to Christ and not to Peter or the Pope. I meet a lot of Roman Catholics. In John 3, 5, I've written uh, the reasons why born of water does not refer to baptism. In Acts 2.38, I've written there why that we don't believe in baptismal regeneration. I can go right there. And uh, I, uh, also things such as weights and measures is a good thing to write in the margin of your Bible. The Bible uses uh, cubits. What's a cubit? How many of you can stand up and tell me what a cubit is? Okay, a few. Okay, a few. But, but only a few. Well... If you read that, in the Bible, Old Testament's full of cubits. And if you read that, there's not, a pitch, there's not an image at all in your mind of what that might be, if you don't know. It's 18 inches. And, uh, but, you know, years ago when I first learned that, not only did I write in one place, but I, I, I actually computed all of those. Like in the tabernacle, the dimensions of the tabernacle, the dimensions of the ark that Noah had. It's all in cubits. And... Uh, I have calculated that in the margin of my Bible. Now, in some reference Bibles, I already have that for you. But mine never has, and I, I calculated that. And so I, as soon as I read that verse, and it says the tabernacle was so many cubits by so many cubits or whatever, uh, I immediately have that calculated out there. I don't have to try to do it in my mind. And so those kind of things to write in your Bible. And... Uh, Leading thoughts and important repetitions. We've already dealt with that, but carefully marking your Bible. 
I think it's a very important part of learning. And it helps you focus on things. And we're going to get into that more tomorrow night. But we've run out of time tonight. We're dealing with uh, daily Bible study. And having a pencil for marking the Bible and how to mark the Bible. So we'll continue that tomorrow night. Yeah, this is not preaching. I'll give you money back guarantee. If you apply these things, you'll never regret this week.